sleeping sweep your eyes from the dark like a mist waving and when darkness comes you Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to North Park Community Church. We are so glad that you have joined us here to worship God on this beautiful Sunday morning that we have together. If you are at home joining us for our live stream service, welcome to you. We are so glad that you are also joining in with us to worship God today. And if this happens to be your first time with us here at North Park or first time connecting with us online, a very special welcome to you. Make sure if you're online, say hello in the chat and someone will get you connected further with how you can connect with us as a church. And if you're here on site, if you haven't done so already, if this is your first Sunday or maybe you've been here for a couple of weeks, but you're looking for ways to get more connected into our community here at North Park, I encourage you to stop by the welcome desk before you leave today and speak with someone about how you can get more connected here. And then remember that between our services in the gym, we have a coffee time where you can connect with people over a cup of coffee. So uh, maybe you're just getting in now, but for next Sunday when you come, maybe you want to come 15 or 20 minutes earlier, go to the gym and meet some people in between those tour services because we love connecting with people, and we love connecting with our great and glorious God. And so to start our service today, we're going to join our hearts together in worship, as no matter what we faced this week, right, it might be a, a great week for you. Maybe it's been a difficult week for you, but we join together here in this community to remind each other that regardless of what happens in life, God loves us, God cares about us, God is good and God is always faithful. So why don't you stand and join our voices together as we worship God together. Thanks, Matt. Let's open up with a little scripture here before we get started. Psalm 34, verses 1 to 3. And uh, if you could read it along with us, that'd be amazing. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Oh, it's a beautiful thing to worship and to gather together like this. What a privilege. And uh, this next song, we're going to sing Psalm 92. So it's coming straight from the scripture. So let's lift our voices up together. It is good. 
is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my debt is paid. Now my debt is paid. It is paid in full. Then my Jesus Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Who the Son sets
death could not hold you. The veil told me for you. He silenced the voice of sin and grave. The heavens are rolling. Praise of you. these words as solemn truth that death could not hold you that indeed the veil tore before you that you silenced forever the boast of sin in the grave and we as a church are joining in the choruses of the heavens roaring praise of your glory this morning because you are raised to life again. You are no longer in the grave. And we delight in you this morning. Our focus, the reason why we gather and we encourage each other and we hold each other up and we stand firm together because of you, Lord, what you have done, what you're doing, and what you will continue to do. We join with the churches that are underground, the churches that are persecuted, the small, the great, and we all corporately gather to worship you, Lord. We are with them, we are with each other, declaring your worth, your glory. We love you, Lord. Jesus' name. Let's sing that chorus one more time. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name. Let's sing that. Death could not hold you. The veil told me for you. You silenced the boast 
Thank you so much. Go ahead and have a seat. As I said, we are so thankful that you are here to worship the powerful, amazing name of Jesus together with us in community. Isn't that right? We are here because of one name and one name only, one God and one God only. But we come together as individuals, but we come together collectively as a community. We are North Park Community church. And we do life and we do faith together with Jesus, not just on Sundays, but each and every day. And I hope that you know that to be true, whether you're here with us in person in our service or whether you're part of our online community. We do this together in the name of Jesus. And we want to be connected to one another. We want to be connected to each other in relationship, but most importantly, we want to be connected to Jesus in relationship. And as a church, we try to make opportunity for those connections to happen each and every week. And so I want to turn your attention to the screens, and here's some upcoming opportunities for you to get connected in relationship with one another, but also with Jesus. I love those little video montages. I hope you don't just watch them and kind of get mesmerized by the images. Did you notice in there? That's community right there. All ages and stages, all different types of opportunities to connect, doing life and doing faith together. I hope you connect with some of those things or you're connecting with those. As always, check out northpark.ca, our website. Follow us on our social media platforms, Facebook or Instagram, for all these ways that you can get connected to what God is doing in us, but also through us as a church community. Two things I want to quickly highlight, an opportunity tonight for you to connect with the Hendersons, Phil and Marilee Henderson. They are missionary partners of ours, have been for years. Many of you will know the Henderson name, might be new to some of you, but tonight from 7 to 8 p.m. they're going to be here to share with us all what God is doing in their lives and through their lives as they serve our great and glorious God in Chad in Africa through Mission Aviation Fellowship. So if you can make it out tonight, it's not too late to register or just come tonight, we would love to have have you. And secondly, tomorrow night starts an amazing um, elective that you can take called Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. 
this sounds like it would be a really good course to take. I'm sure we all want to make better decisions in life and live with at least fewer regrets. And this is a four-week uh, course that runs on Monday evenings from 7 to 9, and it's just a great way to take some biblical principles into our everyday decisions. And how can we start making and continue to make better decisions with hopefully fewer regrets. So that might interest you. And lastly, I want to let you know that we are so excited about what God is doing in and through us that we have opportunities for people to join us in the work of ministry here at North Park. We have seven summer internship positions for youth ages 15 to 30 who are looking for a job. We'll have nine weeks, basically July and August for 30 hours a week in children's ministry and youth ministry and in a tech position. If you know of someone who's just finishing high school or is looking for a summer job, we would love to receive an application. So make sure you spread the news on that. We're also hiring a full-time pastor of outreach because we believe in what God is doing, not just locally, but also globally here as a church. So if you know of people who'd be interested in those opportunities to be involved in ministry with us, we would love that. And for right now, I'm just going to hand things over to Pastor Paul as he's going to introduce our brand new sermon series that's starting right now. There's something about a butterfly floating across the screen that takes the pain out of a disappointing evening last night. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, ask someone beside you. Anyway, good morning, everyone. And a special hello to those watching via live stream. It's been a while. I don't know whether you noticed, it's been uh, three weeks. Uh, three weeks, Carol and I have been in Scotland and Ireland. See, about a year ago, my niece came to me, and she had just gotten engaged to an Irish chap. And she said, Uncle Paul, would you mind officiating at my wedding in Ireland, in a castle, on May 1st, 2022? It took me to about two seconds to say, I'm in. Now, it's always been a bucket list dream of mine to travel to Scotland, my ancestral homeland. So since we were going to be in Ireland anyway, why not take some time in Scotland? And that's what we did. We left Canada last Easter Monday, and we spent the first eight days traveling through Scotland. I had a chance to visit the small town of Bowness, just outside of Edinburgh, where my maternal grandfather was raised. I stood on the shores of Loch Ness. Now, alas, I didn't see the monster, but it was beautiful. I, I gazed upon the beauty of Loch Lomond, and I traveled the Scottish Highlands. And it was deeply moving for me to experience firsthand the places that my grandfather had described to me as a boy. And then for the second part of our trip, we made our late way to Ireland, the Emerald Isle. And if you've never been to Ireland, it is everything that it's advertised to be. Lush, green, gorgeous, rolling countryside, rugged coastlines. We traveled through Dublin, then made our way southwest to places like Tralee, Cork, Killarney, and Dingle. It was truly breathtaking. And a wedding in a castle? That wasn't too shabby either. Now, for any of you young kids in here thinking about your wedding, talk to your parents about this experience. <laughs> it is pretty good. In fact, the whole trip was wonderful. The only little glitch was, does anyone care to guess? No, we picked good weather. It was the driving. Has anyone ever driven in Scotland and Ireland? Yeah, if you have, you know they drive on the wrong side of the road. They drive on the left side, and everything is flipped, including your position in the car, and it takes some getting used to, for sure. Now, fortunately, in Scotland, a friend that we were traveling with had rented the car, so he was responsible for driving for the first eight days. I sat in the passenger seat kind of navigating for him, giving him gentle reminders when he'd kind of drift away from the center line and towards the ditch. And then we rented a GPS, so that helped as well. In Ireland, it was my turn. The days I spent in Scotland as that guy's wingman surely was beneficial, but it was trial by fire. There was some confusion with the rental car company about our insurance, and so I found out that I was on the hook for a 2,000 euro or 2,700 Canadian deductible. So that meant that any little nick, scratch, dent, fender bender, or worse could be costly to me. Now, before you think, Paul, you're being a little dramatic with all of this, let me show you a picture of the majority of the roads that I traveled in Ireland. Janine put it up. That. Now, to us in Canada, that would be a bike path. 
In Ireland, that was a two-way road. In some places, I had to inch over to the furthest point of the left, avoiding the ditch and the shrubbery, remember, no scratches, so that another vehicle could pass by. Our side view mirrors just a hair width apart. At one point, I came across a front end loader. I had to back up 30 meters into a nearby driveway just to let that thing pass me by. It was crazy. But you know what? I did it. Oh, there were times when I'd forget myself and revert back to my old Canadian driving habits, and Carolyn would have to remind me, Paul, get on the other side of the road, or Paul, you're in the wrong lane on the roundabout, or Paul, look out for the car. Now, she'd say it in a much more loving way than that. <laughs> That's just the way I heard it. But at the end of my time in Ireland, my brain adapted well. My thinking had been transformed to the changes, and I was maneuvering that asphalt like an Indy Grease car driver. But when I returned that car back to the airport on the day we left, I kissed the ground, and I set up a prayer to God. I was so relieved that we got back safely. Have you ever experienced something like this? What you've always known to be true is suddenly flipped upside down and you struggle at first to adapt to the change because it runs counter to the way that you always thought. It runs counter to the way that you've always acted. Just think about that for a moment. Today, as Matt said, we begin a new message series at North Park Fanshawe. And by the way, we're also doing this same message series in Stratford. And later on, you're gonna, we're going to have Kirk here and Trish. Is, we're going to do some switcheroo. It's going to be good. But the series title is, is Transformed, How Jesus Changes Everything. Transformed. This idea of transformation gets tossed around a lot in our world, doesn't it? Especially in the church, even here at North Park. Our mission statement, the very reason why we exist as a church, says that we desire to inspire, support, and mobilize one another to live like Jesus as a transforming and life-giving presence in our families, communities, and in the world. One of the core values of our church is life transformation. We define it as always growing to be more like Jesus, allowing him to transform our motives, thoughts, and actions. So that's all well and good to use transformed in its very definition. But what does the word actually mean? The Oxford Dictionary defines it this way. It is a thorough or dramatic change in form or appearance. In other words, when something or someone goes through the process of transformation, it should look, act, and or think differently than it used to. See, in our culture, we often use the word transformation when we're talking about the renovation of a house. Or maybe when a person goes through a makeover, the house or the person undergoes a major change, and oftentimes they end up looking and or acting differently than they did before. Transformation is change. But for some of us, even hearing the word change causes a little anxiety, doesn't it? Perhaps change is difficult for you, and I feel bad for you because that may be one of the only constants in our world today, is change. Technology seems to be upgrading every few months. Apple just released a third-generation iPhone SE in March of this year. Before that, the new iPhone 13 series dropped six months ago in September 2021. And tech junkies now anticipate a Apple iPhone 14 coming out later this year. That is three iterations of an iPhone in less than a year. So how do we keep up? There seems to be this constant parade of new and improved this or that. Change is inevitable for sure, but it also can be stressful. But as resistant as we are to change, we've all changed, haven't we? Most of you sitting here are not wearing bell bottoms and earth shoes. Your fashion has progressed since the 1970s, for most of you. Think back a year ago or maybe 10 years or 20 years, you've changed. We've all changed. Sometimes it's for the better, sometimes... But much of our lives are a series and a constant journey of change, of adaptation, of transformation. See, if I hadn't transformed my way of thinking about driving in Ireland, I wouldn't be standing in front of you today. I would be in a crash heap at the side of the right-hand side of the road in Ireland. Go home. 
Check out your, or look around your house. Do you remember a time when you were resistant to that Google uh, Nest Hub? Or you were resistant to that Oculus VR headset in your home? Or you were resistant to putting that dishwasher in? Or maybe indoor plumbing? But you caved. And look at the benefits that it's brought you. <laughs> change. Yeah, people tell me, Paul, I don't like change. I, I say, do you have indoor plumbing? Like, you change. Don't, you, you can change. It's okay. But what if I told you that God's greatest desire for you and for me, for us, is to see us changed? Because God values transformed lives. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to open them to the New Testament book of Romans, to a rather well-known passage found in Romans 12 at verse 1. Now, as you're turning there, just listen as I read it to you. Listen to these words. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Now, Romans is such an intriguing book of the Bible. Because I don't know if you've ever noticed, but the first 11 chapters of Romans, the Apostle Paul gets to some very deep theological issues. And then beginning at chapter 12 to the end, chapter 16, he becomes very practical. He encourages us on how we're actually to live our life out in faith toward Jesus each day. And I love how this passage begins. It demonstrates the passion of Paul. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you. Now, notice Paul isn't saying here, hey, guys. If you have a few moments, do you mind if I share a few thoughts? Are you okay with that? Can, can you take a few moments? No, no, no. Paul is emphatic here. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you. So what's he pleading? That you would give your bodies to God because of all that he's done for you. But what does that mean? What does it mean because of all that God has done for you? Does anyone know? What has God done for you? And the list may be endless, but what Paul is referring to is the gospel. It is the good news that because of the love, mercy, and grace of God, he sent his one and only son to live here amongst us on earth. Why did he do that? Oh, it was so that Jesus could teach us about some things for sure. It was so that he could demonstrate the values of the kingdom of God, yes. But maybe more significantly, Jesus came to earth to take on the sins of humanity onto himself. When he was crucified at the hands of the Romans with the Jewish leaders shouting their approval, our sins were crucified with his. His resurrection means our resurrection when we put our faith and our trust in him, which means new and abundant life is available to us right here and right now when we put our faith in Jesus. That is the answer to the question, what has God done for us? Now, given that, doesn't the selfless love of God towards us demand a response? Wouldn't you agree? I mean, how can we receive such an amazing gift from God without offering him something in return? How do you respond when someone gives you something? Sometimes an act of generosity stirs up guilt in us, doesn't it? Because we feel we're not worthy, or maybe we don't deserve it. Or sometimes we have that idea of entitlement, and we've been waiting for that gift all along. Or, or sometimes a gift just elicits an overwhelming sense of gratitude, and all we can say is, thank you. Recently, Carolyn and I were invited to lunch by a dear couple, and as we were enjoying the meal and the conversations, they said they wanted to give us a gift. Now, it was totally unexpected and quite generous, and we were dumbfounded, and we actually tried to give it back because we felt we hadn't done anything to deserve it. We weren't worthy of it, but they insisted. As we drove home afterwards, we just talked about how moved we were by such a kind gesture. And we were filled with this sense of gratitude and thankfulness and the feeling that we wanted to live our lives just like that couple and demonstrate generosity to those around us. And maybe you've had a similar feeling. That's what the Apostle Paul is getting at here in the text. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he's done for you. And then look how Paul goes on. Let them, your bodies, be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. See, Paul says that our response in faith to God's overwhelmingly generous gift of his son Jesus is to offer ourselves back to him as an act of worship. I mean, how can we do anything but that? Do you remember in Old Testament days 
Do you remember in the Old Testament days, God's people used to offer animals as a sacrifice to God? The idea was that the blood of the animal would cover the sins of the people, but it was only temporary. With the birth of Jesus, those days have now passed. His blood shed on the cross covers our sins for all time. And now there's no longer any need to bring an animal before the Lord. Instead, all he wants is us. He doesn't want an animal anymore. He wants you. He wants us to offer our bodies as an act of worship, as living sacrifices to him, to daily lay aside our own desires to follow him, to surrender our energy, our gifts, and our talents to God and trust that that he's going to guide and he's going to lead us every step of the way. Why do we do this? Out of gratitude. We do this. We offer ourselves out of gratitude to the one who stopped at nothing. Just think about that. He stopped at nothing to save you. He gave us his son. And many of you in here today, and for those watching via live stream, you've done that. You've offered your bodies back to God as a living sacrifice. Out of a thankful heart, out of an act of worship, you've offered your lives to him. I did it in a little white chapel at Chesley Lake Camp when I was 11 years old. Overwhelmed with gratitude for all that God has done for me, I surrendered my life to him to use whenever, however, and for whatever he desired. Little did I know at that time that that decision would eventually lead me here at 59 years of age, standing in front of all of you on this date telling you about Jesus. God has a sense of humor. Amen? And maybe you've seen him use you in similar ways. Ways that you never would have expected. So our life as a Christian involves offering ourselves to God as an act of worship, which is good, but it goes even further than that. Look how this passage in Romans 12 continues at verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. See, God wants to do more in our lives. His desire is to transform us into new people. Living as a follower of Jesus involves more than just saying or singing, Lord, I give you my life, and then stepping back and waiting. Oh, that's step one for sure. But then there's some responsibility on our part in this whole transformation process. When I sat in the rental car in the Dublin airport and began the adventure of learning how to drive a car in a whole new way, I didn't just start the engine and say, wee, here goes nothing, and gun it out of the parking lot. Man, remember, I spent eight days in Scotland before this, right? I was in the passenger seat. I got to see the way that things worked. I got to see the way the road navigated. And I also rented a GPS to help guide me in the right direction and to kind of talk me through some of those busier roads so that I stayed where I needed to stay. And it would talk to me in 500 meters, stay to your left, at the next available exit, make a U-turn. I heard that one a lot. (laughs) (laughs) And I had Carolyn and anyone else who happened to be in the car freely offering their advice any time that I got out of the way. And all of those things aided my shifting mindset and helped transform my thinking of how to drive a car for those nine days in Ireland. And I was successful. No dings, no dents, no scratches. Now, of course, the moment I returned to Canada, I had to reorient my thinking all over again as I left Pearson Airport parking lot and had to remind myself, right lane now, Paul, right lane. See, in this passage, the Apostle Paul exhorts the Christians of this day, and he exhorts all of us not to be conformed to the world and its behaviors and its actions that can corrupt our character, but instead be transformed into a new person by, did you catch it? Changing the way that you think. Some translations say renewing your mind. The key to true life transformation is changing the way that we think. And we do have some responsibility in that. It doesn't just happen itself. And let's face it, the self-help gurus in our world, they've been onto this thing for a long time, right? Trying to encourage us to change the way that we think. In his best-selling book, Atomic Habits, author James Clear states that real change comes to our life through the compound effect of hundreds of small decisions we make every day. If you're interested in getting better in better shape, then the encouragement is do two extra push-ups a day. 
If you're interested in making the most of your time, then wake up five minutes earlier every day. If you're interested in wanting to read more books, then read one more page in a book every day. Clear contends that these seemingly minuscule changes in the way that a person thinks and acts can lead to life-altering outcomes. Now, that's all well and good, but as Christians, changing the way we think is not so much so that we can live up to a self-help guru's idea of what a successful life is. Instead, our goal is to have the mind of Christ, to think like Jesus, and to do the will of God. And that's only possible through the work of the Holy Spirit in us. It's only when the Holy Spirit renews and re-educates and redirects and in some cases rewires our minds that we're truly transformed. Simply stated, changing the way that we think according to the Apostle Paul in Romans 12, it means interpreting our life and our world through God's lens and through the Holy Spirit that is in us rather than the lens of personal preference or our own wants and desires, or even the opinion or the approval of others. Just as I had a GPS and other people in the car helping me change the way I think when I was driving in Ireland, the Holy Spirit is our navigation system as Christians. I love what it says in Romans 8, 11, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, do you remember that? It lives in you. Just ponder that. The Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. That is our true north. That is our guiding system. And throughout Scripture, the Holy Spirit is described as, among other things, a comforter, a counselor, a helper, an intercessor, an advocate, a strengthener. I mean, that's quite a support system that we have available to us to live and to think like Jesus in a world that so often prioritizes things that are far from God. But here's the thing I think we often forget as Christians. Not only does the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus mean that we're saved from sin. I mean, that's good. And we talk about that one often, don't we? And we should. But that's only half of the good news. Because too often we think like this. Jesus saved us, therefore, if I can only hold on here on earth until Jesus comes, then I'll get heaven one day. And we find ourselves paralyzed and we're not living the life that God's called us to live. The second part of the good news of Jesus Christ is that we've been saved into a whole new way to live right here and right now. And God wants us to live that way. Listen to how it's described, 2 Corinthians 5 at verse 14. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we've all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they'll live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So we've stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. When we acknowledge and receive what Jesus has done for us, it changes everything. It changes our perspective. It changes our priorities. It changes our motivation. It changes the way that we think. It changes everything. Have you found that to be true in your life? Has Jesus Christ changed everything for you? As I mentioned earlier, the main motivation for our travel to Ireland was a family wedding. Three of our children and their partners decided that they wanted to attend as well. Two of my children were married during COVID, so they never really had a honeymoon, so they decided that this was going to be their honeymoon. We were all on different schedules, which meant that everyone traveled at a different time, but we all met up in Dublin just before the wedding. And one of the things my kids really wanted to experience was they wanted to go to a soccer game in Ireland, in Dublin. They had just heard so much about the crowd and the things that go on with soccer games that they wanted to be part of it. So we bought our tickets, and we made our way to the stadium on a Friday night. And we arrived just in time for the warm-up. Now, on one side of the field, I observed the visiting team, where the players seemed to be running through the drills on their own. They were kind of dribbling the ball on their own. They were keeping it up on their feet. They were taking some shots on the keeper. And they all appeared to be quite skilled. On the other side of the field, the home, seemed, seemed, the home team seemed to be warming up, but they were doing it together. They were passing the ball around. They were running through some plays. They were cheering one another on. And then once the game started, it was apparent almost immediately that the home team was significantly better than the visitors. 
Oh, they were 11 skilled individuals, but now they were spread across the field, passing the ball with precision, forming a cohesive team. Their movement and their team play can created many scoring opportunities as the other teams seem to be disorganized and individualistic. The coach of the home side periodically would shout instructions from the sidelines and adjustments would be made on the fly. It really was a sight to behold. The home team held most of the play throughout the game and ended up winning by a rather lopsided score. Now from my observation, the secret of the success lay in their mindset. Oh, they were skilled individual soccer players for sure, but they knew the best way to win the game was to play as a team and to follow their coach's system. And guess what? It worked. I wish other teams that I knew of would follow that same formula. (laughs) Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. (laughs) But I couldn't help but think this is a bit of a metaphor for the Christian life. Leave it to a former phys ed teacher to come up with that. But God accepts us just as we are. He accepts whatever we bring before him. But when we choose to accept and receive all that he's done for us, our lives are changed. We are transformed into new creations. Remember in the series we did on the Holy Spirit, we talked about regeneration. We're changed. But God doesn't leave us alone. He doesn't leave us dangling in the wind like a bunch of individuals. He gives us a coach. He gives us a counselor, an advocate, the Holy Spirit. And then he gives us community. Look around. This is it, the church. And there's a purpose to this. It's to encourage and support and to challenge all of us in this new way to live. And as our minds are being renewed and the way that we think is changing, it affects our behavior because now we're looking for God's game plan in our life and not our own or what the world teaches us. Do we understand that? It means that the way that we live our lives as followers of Jesus should look different than the way the world lives. Because Jesus changes everything. Look at the last part of Romans 12 too. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. See, the more we practice it, the more we get to know it, God's will. The more it becomes instinct. It becomes part of our DNA so that we can't help but live like Jesus as a transforming and life-giving presence in our families, communities, and the world. We can't help but love and care for people that God brings in our life. We can't help but stand for the very same things that Jesus stood for. We can't help but resist the evil one's ploys and deceptions. Just as the more that I practiced my driving on the roads of Ireland, I became more and more comfortable and proficient in this new way of driving. Just like that soccer team worked through and practiced what the coach system had laid out for them. Practice, practice, practice. They ended up winning. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't revert back to some of our old patterns and some of our old way of thinking sometimes. We will. The last day of driving in Ireland, when I returned the car to the airport, I let down my guard a little bit. I got a little too cocky. I narrowly averted what could have been a costly mistake. And that can happen in our lives as Christians as well. See, this side of heaven, we're going to still have slip-ups. We may lose our cool. We may lie, cheat, give in to temptation, And it's at times like this that instead of walking away in discouragement, we need to turn back to the coach. We need to turn back to the Holy Spirit. We need to go to prayer. We need to read the Bible. We need to surround ourselves with godly people and allow the Spirit to continue to work God's plan through our lives. Let me just say it again. God's greatest desire for you and for me, for us, is to see our lives changed. It's to see our lives transformed. And the evidence of our lives as followers of Jesus to a watching world is seen in the way that we think and the way that we act. It should be different. Listen to what it says in 1 John 2. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims no God but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. This is how we know we're living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. See, transformation begins by changing the way that we think. And when we change the way that we think, we change the way that we live. But remember, it's a process. Our old way of thinking may rear its ugly head sometimes. Just ask my family. Old habits die hard. But God is at work in us, reprogramming our minds and making old things new. 
And I think this is why I relate to the disciples in the gospel so much. They were a motley crew, weren't they? Do you remember the disciples when they followed Jesus? One moment they were amazed by his teachings and miracles, and the next moment they were asking Jesus, where can we get some bread to feed the crowd? One moment they witnessed him walking on water, and the next moment they're in a boat with Jesus in a storm, and they're terrified. They had just seen him walk on water. Did they not think they, he could help them in that situation? I mean, how could they do that? I mean, these guys were real pieces of work, but for three years they traveled with Jesus. They witnessed his life firsthand. They engaged him in conversation. They laughed with him and cried with him. And on the eve of his crucifixion, in the hour when he just needed someone to stand watch over him as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, listen to how his followers responded. Matthew 26 at verse 40. Then he returned to the disciples and he found them asleep. He said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me even one hour? When Jesus needed them most, the disciples fell asleep on him. Not once, not twice, three times. I can relate to these guys. But then jump ahead 40 or 50 days. After Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, these same guys that fell, fell asleep on Jesus just before he was put to death were now leading a movement of God that changed the course of human history. Listen to it at Acts 2, 42. Just listen to these words. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, these same guys, and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place, shared everything that they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. That's quite a change, isn't it? So what happened? It's transformation. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus changed the way the disciples thought. It changed the way that they acted. It changed everything. And a spark was ignited. A movement was afoot. A revolution began. The church of Jesus Christ was established that has lasted for over 2,000 years and has only grown stronger with time. And it has had the most profound effect of any institution on human history. And it all can be traced back to the disciples who had an encounter with the resurrection Jesus. And it changed everything. Foaming at the mouth again. Has that been your experience? Have you met the resurrected Jesus and has it changed everything for you? Is the way that you're living today different than the way the world calls you to live? Has your life been transformed? And if you're unsure, let me just tell you, I have good news for you today. That way of life is available to you right here and right now by simply accepting what God has done for you through his son, Jesus and surrendering control of your life to him. And some of you are here today, and although you have made a decision to follow Jesus in the past, maybe you find yourself not fully living in the life that God has in mind for you. Maybe you've forgotten that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. But, it, but you're not really living today any different than the world around you. You're not living any differently than the neighbor beside you. Will you turn to God today again and invite him to change the way that you think and reorient your thinking back to him? See, we're the church, people. You and me, we are the body of Christ. We're to be an example of Jesus to the world around us. Through our lives transformed by Jesus, people far from God may only have that as the opportunity to encounter who Jesus really is. Not a Bible not coming to church, the only Bible that some people will ever read but will be the way that they see your life change for Jesus. Has your life been transformed? I want to invite you to join us in the weeks ahead as we continue in this series, Transformed, How Jesus Changes Everything. Throughout this series, we're going to take a closer look at how we as Christians are to handle things like conflict. Next week, we're going to talk about how Christians should handle conflict. And guess what? We don't handle it well. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about how we're to handle our resources, the things that God has given us. How do we handle and steward our resources? 
we're going to look at is how we as Christians handle this whole concept about worship and what do we worship. We're going to look at how we as Christians maneuver through the systems of status and power that our world puts up around us. And then we're also going to look at how we navigate through relationships. We will see how our lives transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit can and will be used to help point others to the hope and the saving grace of Jesus. Amen? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful just for the opportunity to gather here today to be reminded of the significance of the church, the role that community plays, and how, how important we are to one another. But God, also thank you for this reminder that you have not left us alone. You have left us with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that lives in us, that transforms our, our lives. And it is a process. I mean, at our conversion, we are regenerated into new people. But the transformation is something that is ongoing. And so as we gather, God, I pray that this isn't, this isn't a frustrating message to people, but they get hope through it, to know that as they turn toward you, you will change the way that they think, that they can grasp onto the hope that they have through you. And that is what can sustain them in good times and more difficult in their life. God, challenge those here today that maybe they feel like uh, they've been exploring Christianity, but maybe they've never really taken the step. They haven't jumped right in and just surrendered completely to Jesus. I pray today may be a changing day in their life that they can know that Jesus is the only hope. Jesus is the only hope that we have in a difficult world. Today, may they put their faith and trust in you and invite you to continue to transform them. And for those that have been Christians maybe all their life, but know there are times when then there's not much different between the way that they're living and the way that the world's living. May they continue to turn back to you, ask you to recalibrate and reorient their lives back to you, God, through your power and through the Spirit. We thank you for all this, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Paul. I would invite you to stand with these last few songs. Let's worship.
We have an awesome opportunity now to close with a powerful song declaring this great hope we have in Christ's resurrection and that way in which he has liberated us from the penalty of death, which is, well, the penalty of sin, which is death. Um, so let's uh, declare this out together.
little too much fun in church, isn't it? He is risen though, right? Yeah, he's raised, he's come out of the grave, right? So why are so many of us still living like he's dead? Why do we still live like he's dead? Jesus has come, has given us new life and his spirit lives in us. And then he calls us to go out into the world and live differently, to live a life that models after him so that people see the hope that we have. So let's go live like that. And you don't go alone. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's the spirit. I pray that you get that hope today. Listen, a couple of things I want to remind you of. Tonight, the Hendersons, missionaries in Chad, Africa, are presenting at 7 here at the church. I want to invite you to come and to listen to some of the heartwarming stories and the way that they see God at work in their midst. And then tomorrow night, we have an adult discipleship elective about making decisions. And these are important. Any electives that we do through adult discipleship, we want all of you to participate. It's part of our discipleship strategy. I mean, Barry, who oversees the ministry, puts a lot of time and effort into making sure that we're growing and challenging each one of you in your faith. So that's tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, Barry? Good. The other thing I want to remind you of is we're having coffee hour kind of between services now. I don't know if you've noticed it, but due to COVID and a lot of what we've gone on over the last two years, we are rebuilding the church. Now, God is the cornerstone, and Jesus Christ and the Spirit are active, but we're rebuilding. I mean, there's people that haven't come back. Some of you are coming back, you know, for the first few weeks, and we're two years in. There's people that we don't know where they are. North Park is rebuilding, but God has always done his greatest work in the most difficult times throughout human history, and we believe that God is going to do an amazing work through North Park Church now and in the future because he, he's our only hope. So all of that saying, we don't have volunteers right now to do coffee after this service. We're moving to that, but we're having coffee between services. So come 10 minutes early and get to know some people, and let's continue to grow as a church. God bless you. You see the sun shining outside. Go and have a great Sunday, and we'll see you back here next week. Blessings. Blessings.